Welcome to a Five Live Sports special where for the next hour we'll be discussing the difficult issue of abuse in sport here as part of the Sport Resolutions Conference in London. You'll be hearing first-hand accounts from survivors of abuse, including a harrowing testimony from a former gymnast who will share with us how her coach abused her from the age of 12. We'll ask what's being done to catch the abusers and protect current and future athletes. I'll be joined by a panel of experts who will give us a national and international perspective I will ask how sport can learn from the crises in public bodies such as the church, the NHS and the BBC. Well, in our audience are leaders from some of our biggest sporting institutions as well as current and former athletes. You'll hear from some of them over the next hour. First though, we're going to hear from a survivor. Gloria Viseras is a Spanish Olympic gymnast and a former national champion in her sport. For the next 20 minutes, Dr. Phil Hopley, consultant psychiatrist who runs a confidential helpline service across 14 sports in the UK, will talk to Gloria about what happened to her during her gymnastics career and how it's impacted on her life since she left the sport. Please welcome Dr. Phil Hopley and Gloria Viseras. So Gloria, first of all, a big thank you on behalf of everybody here for taking the brave step of sharing your story with you, with us. Um, we're going to explore a number of difficult and challenging issues, but this all sits in the context of sport, sport, that amazing thing that so many people benefit from and engage in. Gymnasts hit that success at a very young age, so I imagine for you, getting involved in sport started early. And I wonder if you could start by telling us about how you came to be a gymnast. When I was three, um, my family lived in Mexico City. My father was a journalist and was working there. So um, I don't remember anything, but they, they tell me they took me to the gymnastics arena to see Vera Kavslavska. And uh, they always say how they had to drag me out of the gyms uh, screaming because I didn't want to leave the, the, the arena. Um, after that, my life got literally upside down. Um, I became more down than up. And so when we moved back to Spain, uh, my parents looked for a place to, for me to, to practice gymnastics, um, you know, with mats and a pit um, and a coach. So and was that's that how a, I a local club or a school set up? I started in a, in a local club, um, but, you know, quite early uh, they, they saw that I had some potential. So they, uh, it was like at eight, <laughs> Uh, I started working out in the National Training Center. Uh, I started with a coach, uh, a Russian coach called Nina. I had very good memories of her. Um, she used to tell us uh, all the time to be krasiva. Krasiva means pretty in, in Russian. She told us to be out there and be uh, like a Russian Tsarina. So we, we got on the beam and became uh, Katalina the first of Russia. <laughs> so she, she was nice. Um, and that was happy times there. You say happy times. I mean, how much did you enjoy what you were doing and how focused were you? How important was gymnastics in the life of this young girl? It was girl? my life. It was my passion. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to do gymnastics as, uh, you know, and, and represent my country in, in, at the Olympics and be like Vera Kavslavska at the time. Then Nadia Comaneci, but you know, at first it was just a, you know, back when, when gymnastics was a sport for women. So, um, you know, I, want, I was one of the first girl gymnasts in my country, I'm known for that. And so that passion was combined with that drive and it sounds as if you really enjoyed what you were doing. Yeah. And as a parent of children who, who love sports, it's a very wonderful experience that you get as a parent watching yeah. them develop and get those very widespread benefits of mm. achievement, sociability, personal development. But I wonder, what was the involvement of your family around gymnastics in the early years? Well, um, you know, I was eight. Um, they had to take me to the gym and bring me back home. Um, it was, they were, you know, they didn't have any holidays because I had to train. It was, you know, the whole family had to be involved in it. Yeah. So dedication, following. Yeah. When did things become difficult? When did things change? You described getting into that national mm. setup and really enjoying the work with that first yeah. coach. When did things change? She, um, she decided to move back home and then uh, Jesus Carvalho, who was the national coach for the men, started helping her with us. There were five, um, you know, we were about nine or ten years old and um, were, we were the hopefuls. 
and he started coaching us. Um, and when she left, he stayed. He he took he took care of the of that group of girls, and, and what, started. What was he like to begin with? He was very charming. Uh, we found very nice and we, we very funny his little games like of seduction. Uh, he would give a little kiss to my teammate and then look at me like like saying, um, you know, if you're good, I'll give you one, like two. Uh, uh, you know, but then it, it started getting all wrong. Um, he started like forbidding us to, to, to speak with the boys in the gym. Um, there were boys our age who, with whom we just played hide and seek the day before and all of a sudden we couldn't even look at them, we couldn't say hello, we couldn't answer a good morning and we have to sit in the gym and looking down to the floor. Um, so, um, you know, and then he started humiliating us or insulting us, he called me a whore all the time, um, you know, and he just waited, he was, he was testing the limits, you know, he was, he waited to see if we told our parents, and uh, so it developed like that, then, um, then he started giving us a massage um, in the warm-up room in the basement, and that's how it all started, yeah. And, and meanwhile, your parents are driving you back and forth from yeah. training, and there's been a very significant change in your experience of this sporting mm. environment. Were they aware at that young age? I think I never spoke with my with my my father died some years ago, and without knowing what had happened to me. Um, but I think he he knew something was wrong. Um, he, um, you know, after the Olympics. Uh, the first day that I came out crying, he, uh, he went for the coach and had a very strong discussion. I was outside just hearing how they screamed at each other and he never let me go back. So I guess he knew something was wrong, didn't know what the extent of it was. But facing another Olympic cycle like that, he just, he just thought he was not going to go for it. I mean, he, he just pulled me out of there. But this was years after the abuse had started? Yeah. And am I right in understanding, as is often the case with paedophiles, that the environment was very carefully controlled, that there was a culture of fear, yeah. that there was not just the sexual abuse, but the psychological control and, yeah. and manipulation. That was all part of the He controlled every aspect of our lives. He controlled what we ate. He controlled what listened, what, what music we listened. He used to control our, um, you know, our CDs. Um, he controlled everything. You have to understand that in gymnastics, you, the bond is really very strong because you trust your coach with your life, literally. Um, so if he told me to go up on the beam and do a double back of it, I would go up and do it. If he told me not to eat dinner that night, I would not eat dinner. And um, I would not question him uh, if he made me do bars with a cast on my leg. And I would not question him if he ordered me to open my mouth for him. And do you think that this was just directed at you at the time? Uh, no, I think uh, there were others. I didn't want to know about that uh, back then. Uh, today I know there were others. Um, actually, he married one of my teammates uh, years later. Um, and he lives with her and has a son with her today. In the work that I do, Gloria, we see the very significant psychological damage that follows in the aftermath of child mm. sexual abuse. How did this impact on you? Um, it, it's, it still has an impact on me today. I still suffer from the consequences of it. Um, I spent 30 years uh, just keeping that secret, uh, so I didn't have any treatment back then. Um, it, you know, I, I spent 30 years trying to cope with um, migraines, um, suicide attempts, um, bulimia, 12 years of bulimia. And, um, you know, uh, it's really hard. You said to me earlier that you thought when your father pulled you out of that national training camp, things would be better and there was a sense of relief. Yeah, it was, you know, I couldn't have made that decision, so it was a relief for me, but it was very liberating. And I thought since the sexual abuse had stopped, um, that everything else would stop and everything would be okay and I would start being a normal kid. 
but I was very wrong. You know, when you, when you get pulled out of such a control, disciplined environment, it's like being left alone in a street, in a place you don't know, with people you don't know, that speak a language you don't know, and knowing that you will never be able to go to, back to the life that you've known before. So it's like you don't know how to live your new life. And it's, it, you know, it takes a lot of effort to, to move on. I see this with transition under less traumatic circumstances mm -hmm. in, in every sport that we work with. And that loss of identity and moving from something that you're passionate mm -hmm. about to something where you feel slightly out of place and you're not quite sure who you mm -hmm. are is difficult for a 25 year old, a 30 year old, the younger you are, the earlier your career is interrupted, quite often the bigger mm -hmm. the impact and there you were as a teenager having this beset you. So in the aftermath of that, what did you feel about gymnastics? What did you feel about sport? What was your relationship like? I stopped anything to do with sport. I didn't even watch sport on TV afterwards for many years. I didn't want to have anything to do. I just wanted to run away and not look back. <laughs> and that's what I did. I, um, you know, I didn't have anything else to, sport, to do with sport after that, so until the, recently. The experience tainted all of your experience yeah. about sport prior to that, but here you are today being incredibly brave, as I said before, sharing your story. So mm -hmm. what has changed? Well, um, four years ago, I, um, I started, I decided to share some pictures with some of my old teammates with whom I hadn't had any contact in over 30 years. So we started meeting again, we started talking, and we realized that, um, that we hadn't been you know, that, that I hadn't been the only one uh, suffering from this. We, we found out that, um, that the Federation, the Gymnastics Federation had known about it, didn't know anything about it. And I realized that I had some uh, witnesses to the abuse, direct witnesses. So it became very, very important for us to speak out because he was still coaching the national team and there were very young girls uh, at his care. So we, we, we thought, what if he had been abusing the girls for, girls for 30 years? So we had to speak up and it's been very difficult, but we, you know, we've managed to make some changes with it. So I'm happy about that. And those changes, and of course being here today is a, a great opportunity to, to share this story and mm -hmm. push those changes forward. What is it you're seeking to achieve? Well, um, you know, when, when you speak about violence in sport, you tend to think about a bunch of fans fighting on the stands of a football uh, match. And what I want is that society moves away from the stands for a little bit and looks down on the field. There is a lot of violence happening on the fields and in the gyms, in the pools against athletes. And until we acknowledge that, and until we listen to to people who have suffered what I, what I suffered and learn how these environments work. Uh, only then we can start working on prevention and on putting all the control mechanisms in place so that children can do sport safely and healthily. And are there specific programs you're involved in at the moment that are seeking to increase awareness and open the door and therefore allow the opportunity mm -hmm. for preventative strategies? Yeah, right now I am um, in a project called VOICE. It's an EU project. Um, it's funded by the Erasmus Plus um, Fund. And it's all about hearing the voices of those who were affected by sexual abuse in sport. So, um, you know, you can find us in the, in the net, uh, Voices for Truth and Dignity, and I invite everybody who's been affected by this to come forward and tell us your story because um, you know society needs to listen to those stories. And listen not just with your ears, you have to listen with your eyes, with your heart. You have to listen to, to those athletes who, who stop smiling, to the athletes who stop eating. And uh, because the signs are always there and only after you listen to those stories and learn how those environments work and how those pedophiles um, do their grooming and all this stuff, only then you can, you can understand and you can really work on prevention. And, and how are people responding to that opportunity to come forward and share? We are at the very, the very early stages of the project. 
but um, we are already having some response to that and it's going to be very positive. It's going to be positive for those who participate in the project because uh, you know it's very liberating to be able to to speak about that in an environment where you know where you're protected. Uh, you know it can be confidential or it can be in the open. You know it's all about it's it's up to whoever you know to the person what people are comfortable yeah. with. And in terms of the support and help that you eventually accessed, what was helpful for you? Uh, well. Um, we decided to go to the sports ministry and ask for help because we, we were very worried about the kids that were still at his care. And uh, they provided all the all this support and all the counseling that we needed, legal counseling and psychological counseling. I've been in treatment now finally, um, you know, for the cause of all my problems. Because, you know, usually you tend to, to treat the symptoms, you know, they treat you for the bulimia, but they don't treat you for the cause of the problem. So I've been in treatment now for two years and I'm doing really well. And, um, you know, it helps me a lot with my, you know, going forward with my life. <laughs> I'm sure it does. And I'm sure the proof of it being successful yeah. is the fact that you're sitting here talking to me. You're also a mother and you've had this very sensitizing experience around sport. So what's your attitude been as a parent towards your children in sport? Actually, I have um, an elite athlete in my, you know, my, my older son is a um, silver medalist, silver world medalist in handball when he was a teenager, when he was in the junior category. So my experience, my, my, I work, I, what I try to do is to keep an, a, an open line of communication with my children. Um, because before they're able to tell you something important, they have to be able to tell you a lot of unimportant things and you have to listen to all of them. Um, so I hope that by doing this, they will be able to, to talk to me and tell me if something happens to them. And how aware of your story are they? Oh, my oldest sons, I have a 24 and 21 year old. They learned about it when I, when I disclosed. Uh, they didn't know about that before. The little one is uh, still, we will try to keep her a little bit from it. Still, she's nine, so we, but, but we will do, we will do it with her too. The, the time has to be right, but as you say, how you create that environment for open dialogue is, is yeah. a critical skill. And what about skills for coaches and organizations? What should people be aware of? What should we be doing in terms of safeguarding strategies? Actually, I do, uh, sometimes I speak in front of um, um, future coaches because I think that is very productive. Um, they need to be aware of things and to, to be able to protect their, the, the athletes. Like I said, listen, listen to the, to the athletes. They, the signs are always there and uh, we need to put more protection mechanisms in place for, for those environments not to become an environment in which the, uh, the abuse can take place. And what would you like to see specifically in terms of authority responses in Spain, for example? Oh, for, for a start, I would like the uh, Statue of Limitations <laughs> to be removed from Spain so that we can at least put our, our abusers in front of a judge. But there is a lot of work to do on prevention, on setting up the protocols within the clubs, within the, the, the basic structures of sport. There's nothing done on that. And finally, this, here you are as a parent, your own children. There's been a huge shift in society between attitudes when you were a child and attitudes now there's much more access to information people are more aware and i'm sure that your parents like my parents weren't those people that would be comfortable talking about sex for example but what advice looking back would you as a parent now give to yourself as that young gymnast in order to make that person better able to protect themselves that's a difficult question because i still today i still think that if if I look back at how I was and how things were back then, I still think I wouldn't have been able to speak up. But what I think is that it's not for the, for the uh, victims to speak up, but for the adults to act and for the adults to provide the safe environments for the children. So it's to teach families to recognize the signs, but to work from the bottom up and to work on prevention from the lower levels of, uh, of the sports structures. Thank you. And it was wonderful that eventually your father could see 
that this outgoing, happy, mm -hmm. very engaged child had changed in nature and mm -hmm. picked up on those signs. So educating parents is obviously yeah. a key part of this as well. Yeah. Gloria, thank you so much You're for welcome. that brave sharing. And if the audience would join me in thanking you. I just wanted to back up what Phil has said, Gloria. Thank you so much for talking to us so honestly about what happened to you. And I just wanted to maybe follow up with a, a couple of questions of my own. And you talked about the fact that you felt obviously betrayed by your coach, but then the fact that your federation allowed him to continue to work for 30 years. Did you feel betrayed by, by them as well, by that federation? Yes. Do you know that still today I haven't received one phone call from anybody in, the, in that federation. Um, today, the, the, the son of my abuser is the president of the Spanish Gymnastics Federation, and uh, there's nothing we can do with them. I mean, I, we are completely <laughs> banned. Um, so do you think that they have been in denial about what happened to you and to the other athletes? Yes, they, they certainly are. And you, you mentioned as well that you talked to your teammates when you finally were able to, to talk to them but none of you had ever talked about it before. Mm. Is, I suppose is that, that's the, the secrecy yes. that goes around child abuse in a way. Yes, it becomes one of your more important goals in your life is to keep that secret, you know, because you were raised to be a role model. Um, you are raised to be a champion and uh, being a little slut is not being a role model, you know, and that's, that's what you believe when you go through that. You believe it's your fault, you believe uh, you're responsible for what, what, uh, what he's doing to you, and you don't want anybody to know about that. And so. Phil, the fact that you're talking to somebody like Gloria, who is in a sport like gymnastics, which as you said is something which draws in its athletes extremely young, is it no coincidence that somebody who is a paedophile is drawn to being a coach in a sport like that? No, I think it's no surprise at all. And, it, and if we think about the account that Gloria gave, particularly around the way in which that coach started off as being very charming, very seductive, very positive, creating the environment where he was trusted. And then once he was the only coach working with the squad, he very quickly moved to a situation where everything was rigidly controlled. I understand, Gloria, that you would come to training an hour before all the other yeah. girls and would have to wait in the warm-up room or the massage room, and that's where the abuse would take place. He was able to manipulate the system so effectively that that's what made it a, a sort of an ideal yeah. area for him to be a predator. Did he encourage you to not tell anybody? Presumably that was the whole thing. Was it? You hear people talking about saying, this is our secret. Like I said, uh, gymnastics is a dangerous sport. Um, when you're learning a trick, for example, and at first you need to be spotted, you need to be helped, you need to have the mats put in place. And he, he used to say, well, if you're not good, then you'll do the double back all by yourself today. So, or he would punish you to go up 20 ropes with bleeding hands when you had bleeding hands from, from doing bars. So he knew, he knew how to manipulate and he knew how to, uh, how to manipulate one with one thing and the other one with other things. He, he knew who to pick. And we have a room full of people here who work in sport, who work in a range of different sports. Do you think that some of them may have to think, is there anybody in our organisation who is like your coach was? Can people here look at them themselves and look at their organisation and think, this is not a problem that we have? They need to look good. I think, like I said, I think the signs are always there. When the athletes stop smiling, stop driving, stop going there with a smile on their faces, when, uh, when the, the environments become too controlled, uh, when there is too much power, when one person has too much power over the, the, the whole structure uh, in a club or in, a, in, a, in an organization, you have to raise the, uh, the, the, the alarm. Because you have to really think what's going on and, uh, and do something, you know, act. And Phil, we've said that you, you run a helpline. How hard is it for athletes to come out and speak and to pick up the phone and talk about such things? And I think it's very difficult because if you think about the whole nature of being a sportsman or a sportswoman, it's all about success, it's all about victory, it's all about performing to the best of your abilities. And if, as is commonly the case, there is stigma around abuse, it's similar with mental health issues, 
there's going to be a perception that by declaring this issue, it's going to impact on how you're perceived by your coaches, your club, your teammates. So it's very difficult. The, the stigma is definitely shifting. One of the key things in this area is to ensure that support that's available is confidential, absolutely confidential, and sits outside the management structure that the player is working in. Because as you can imagine, if you're someone who has a, an issue like this, the impact on maybe contract renegotiations or how you're perceived can be massive. So it has to sit independent of that. And that's where the sports associations in this country do really wonderful work by providing and funding these helpline type services. How do you feel about the sport of gymnastics now, Gloria? I uh, watch gymnastics from the sidelines. <laughs> I'm trying to reconciliate with my sport. Um, actually, one of the reasons why it all started moving inside of me was uh, the day my daughter came to me and said she wanted to try to do gymnastics, artistic gymnastics. And oh, that was very hard for me to, to let her try. Um, but I don't want to have any much to do with it, um, you know, in the, in the day to day. So you're happy to let her do I did, gymnastics. I did. I sat uh, in a gym from a, a friend of mine has a, has a gym and I sat and watched uh, the, the, the training sessions for like 20, 30, years, 30 days before I even started letting my, my daughter go there. But, you know, and, until I knew that, that everything was safe and everything was fine there, I didn't let her. But she, she tried. She said she didn't like it. And now she's playing basketball. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's found a sport that she loves, which yeah. is the important thing. That's we all right. want to be able to love the sport that we do and we let our children do as well. That's right. Gloria, thank you for telling us thank your story. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Phil as well. Thank you, Phil. Um, we will talk more about the subjects that you raised in the second half of the programme. We'll have reaction to what we've heard from Gloria. And we'll also talk about what safeguards are in place for those athletes who might be facing abuse. This is Five Life Sport with Eleanor Aldroyd. Welcome back to our special Five Live Sport programme on surviving abuse in sport from the Sport Resolutions Conference in London, where leaders from some of the country's top sporting bodies are joined by current and former athletes and legal experts. Well, earlier on, we heard the first-hand account of Gloria Viseras, a Spanish Olympic gymnast who was abused by her coach. She talked about how it began with seduction by giving massages and then the control, the bond between the coach and the athlete turned it into something very much more sinister, but she's now brave enough to come out and talk about her experiences. So we're now going to talk about how safe sport is for athletes here in the UK, what sporting bodies are doing to protect the young people in its care. And as the Goddard Inquiry looks into abuse scandals in public institutions such as the church, the NHS and the BBC, how robust are the safeguarding policies in sport? Well, joining me are Andy Parkinson, who's Chief Executive of British Rowing, Catherine Starr, Founder and President of Safe for Athletes, who represented Great Britain in swimming at the Olympics and Commonwealth Games, and is also herself a survivor of abuse. Michael Pether is partner at BLM Law and specialises in defending abuse claims. And Anne Tivas is Director of the NSPCC Child Protection in Sport Unit. Welcome to the four of you. Let's just reflect, Catherine, with you, first of all, on Gloria's story. How typical is it of the stories that you hear from young athletes who've been abused? Listening to Gloria triggers, you know, my experience of, you know, like sort of when I started, you know, what happened. But I think, you know, listening to her story this morning, you know, sort of hearing the dissipation of the passion. Um, and I think that that's what uh, it gets turned inward into the pain that, that one experiences who's been abused. And you know, I started at three, and I think uh, Gloria said she started at three, and and um, I slept in my swimsuit when I was a child. I mean, you know, you wake up in the morning and you have like indents into your skin because you're so excited, you know, to like get in the pool and, you know, just like that desire and, and um, watching um, my first Olympic games where I could remember I was eight years old and my neighbor had won five 
I think four golds and one silver. And I grew up on a street in the US that we had five Olympians on this one street. I was the only non-gold medalist. But, but the excitement and the bond that I, that I had with my father, uh, you know, watching those Olympic games, and then to it turn into this um, separation of, you know, not being able to share your experience and, you know, just that the, the sadness. And, it's certainly also what triggered for me was um, seeing the sadness in Gloria's eyes. And it was hard for me just to look at that because I, I, I saw her pain. And I think, uh, you know, I'm very connected to, um, you know, a lot of athletes that, you know, certainly a lot of athletes today. And um, just to understand that depth of that experience and for somebody to be on the other side and say, I know, I, I've been there, I, I feel that. Um, is, uh, you know, it's a bond that you don't want to have, ideally, but it's also a blessing to be able to, um, you know, connect with that. So, um, and so, and I'm sorry for your experience. Um, what about you? You've heard Gloria speak before, haven't you? Yes, I have heard Gloria speak before, and the first time that we heard her speak, the audience was almost unanimously in tears, and we had a senior minister from the Austrian government present there who was actually unable to speak because of what she had just heard, and it was an entirely appropriate response um, to what had been heard. And I think there's a big, we, we hear a lot of this, obviously in 15 years of the Child Protection and Sport Unit, we've heard just about every poor experience that, that you can have. We've been very, very fortunate in that we've had very strong leadership from the sports councils in the UK that have encouraged this work to be developed, encouraged governing bodies to respond and to build on probably the biggest need, which is to give athletes a voice. I think that's one of the things that Gloria spoke very clearly about. Children and young people, particularly in sport, were not listened to for a very long time. Whereas in the rest of their lives, they might be able to have a school council or be, have a, a youth council in their schools and other environments. Sport really wasn't set up for listening to its participants. That has been a sea change, but there is still a very, very long way to go. There'll be athletes here and athletes in other countries preparing for Rio who can't speak out at the moment because of the risk of losing their medals, their place in teams. And we still need to do a lot more to create an open culture where all athletes, young and old, feel able to turn to somebody. But also I think the important point that um, Gloria made was that for most people, they can't speak. What's happening to them is so terrifying. They also see other people getting very poor responses in some sports and they're frightened and, and don't know who they can turn to. So it does rely on the whole entourage, the whole of sport to be prepared and to understand these are the indicators of something going wrong. I do need to speak out, I do need to do something. So Catherine, there are young athletes at this moment preparing to compete who are being abused by their coaches. Yes, uh, you know, I can unequivocally say that um, I have worked with uh, some elite athletes and some of them are... They're over the age of 18, and I think it becomes this um, lost, you know, sort of understanding um, of not really understanding the power dynamic and, you know, the commitment that you have. It's your commitment to your passion. Witnessing this need to wait and, you know, you have your financial well-being, this idea that, you know, the money that you have this talent and the money you're going to make is from sponsorships and everything else. And at the same time, in certain situations, you have the, the other people who are following up behind and they're walking into these situations that are extremely abusive. And, and then you also have an, the situation of watching these coaches who are saying all the right things, but doing all the wrong things. And it's one of those like, you know, let me tell you all the right things and they're just as charismatic out publicly around the topic, and then inside uh, the athletic and the training environment, it's very abusive. We are looking at um, leadership in, in this area where um, the only uh, check mark is how good are your athletes? And it should be a check mark of the mental health and the well being and everything else that goes with the, the wholeness of, of the person. Um, and that their rights as a, their human rights haven't been violated through this process, but we miss that. Andy, you're listening to, to what Catherine and Anne have said, nodding. As somebody who's been involved in sport in different sports for, for quite a while, what does it make you f feel to hear their stories? I think I, I was sitting there listening to Gloria, and aside of the, 
the fantastic work that she's doing in terms of raising the awareness of this, what it reinforces to me is the duty of care that we as national governing bodies have and the sense of responsibility that we have in, in making sure that the environment that people are participating in, as well as competing in, is enjoyable. Um, and that goes from all the way from our elite team all the way down to the riverside. Uh, I guess the, the real challenge that I would imagine most sports face at the moment is one of being slightly overwhelmed by the complexity, by how to deal with these types of situations. Um, in the previous uh, set, you talked about the confidentiality element, which is so fundamental. But you know what? Sport's not actually very good at that. We tend to operate in quite closed environments where people know each other a lot. So the confidentiality piece is so, is so important, which then leads, just leads the conversation to the, the simple fact of good governance. If you've got a system in place that can allow people to talk to you openly with confidence that you're going to do something about it, um, then you've got a shot at at least providing a safe environment for your people. We heard from Gloria, Michael, that the Spanish Gymnastics Federation seemed to be in complete denial at what was happening to its athletes. Is that something that's reflected in, in the, your experience that you've had as well, that, that people don't really know what their coaches are getting up to? I think generally the, there, is a, the, there is a shift, and uh, it's only happened quite recently within the last few years, but there's been a shift from a culture of what we term sort of disbelief of a victim of abuse, which is reflected very well with sort of in, in Gloria's experience, to a culture of belief and the triggers that uh, have changed that culture. There's, there's more work to be done. The trigger for that change, uh, which has encouraged victims to come forward, triggers were the Savile. Uh, revelations, followed very closely by the child sexual abuse revelations in Rotherham and other local authorities, which really pushed the issue of um, child abuse in very different sectors to the top of the agenda and, and gave a lot of victims who were sort of had for years and years and years not been able to come forward with their, uh, with their experiences, um, gave them the confidence to do that. And it's a change in that culture, which was, there's a lot of work to be done. And I'm sure there are a lot of institutions, including sport institutions, that, that need to put in place processes that encourage the victims to come forward. Michael mentions Savile, and, and we know now that he was one of the most vile paedophiles that this country has seen. Is, is the level of the abuse that his victims suffered, is that replicated in sport, do you think? Are there, are there coaches doing to young athletes what Savile did to his victims? Undoubtedly there are. Um, we, we do need to have some more willingness from governing bodies to share their case data with us to help us have a full picture. But all of the research that's been done, wherever there are children and young people, wherever there are vulnerable or adults at risk, there will be people who seek to harm them. The things that make a difference are the culture in those environments. What we're seeing through the Goddard inquiry and other institutional abuse inquiries around the world is a focus on how institutions operate and how leadership operates to create a culture where any issues that are arising will be picked up. If you have a closed community where people aren't able to speak out, where there aren't policies and procedures, then that's an environment that's ripe to, to be abused. I think we're moving very much in the right direction in the UK, but there are a lot of organisations that don't face the scrutiny that the sports councils put on the um, organisations in the UK. And that's one of the places that we really do need to be looking, all the unregulated bodies. We may have a new governance code coming, but we do need to ask the questions about the sports bodies that aren't actually subject to those requirements. What do we do about those? What do we do about private leisure operations? and people who aren't currently being scrutinised because those will be environments where abuse will occur. Catherine, we, we heard that you're a survivor of abuse yourself. I don't know how much you are able to, to discuss that with us, but you're talking to other victims of abuse all the time. What sort of stories are they telling you? I mean, the abuse ranges from sexual, you know, sort of joking, touching from your coach to ongoing sexual relations. It varies. And, and I think what the most frustrating part of it is, is that these initial boundaries that are broken down, and Gloria talked about that, like the, you know, the, the boundaries that get broken along on the she way. She talked about seduction at one point yeah. in, her, in her account. And seduction, when you're talking about a 12-year-old child, it couldn't be more inappropriate. 
If I could share a, like kind of a personal story um, that happened along the way, I was training with Sharon Davis for a couple years, and then she retired, and I moved um, to Coventry, and that's where I was training with Paul Hickson. And I was at that stage of my career. I had just turned 13, and I had made the British national team. And it was I was the youngest person on the team, and um, so I was interviewed by ITV, like the local Midlands ITV, and. Um, so the TV cameras come in, and I'd been, because I was an American and I moved over to uh, Britain, I'd already been quite popular in the news, just, you know, training with Sharon Davis and what have you, and, but I'm, ha I'm having this interview, and I'm, I'm in my swimsuit, and, and the, the Coventry Swim Center is all glass, it's just very exposing, and, um, and I'm sitting on the, the bench there, and so, and he just places his hand on me during this interview and starts rubbing my who is, leg. Who is he? Paul Hickson, who was my abuser. And I remember sitting there with the with the uh, you got the camera person and the you know you have the um, per person who's doing the sound and you know just to feel like so exposed and so publicly like here I am on getting filmed and this abuse is like happening in broad daylight. And nobody stopped it. And so that was like the beginnings of, and it happened before then. I was already being groomed along the way. But that was like that pivotal moment of nobody will believe me. And here I am, like in a very public way. Um, and they went on with the interview, and I was the superstar. And, you know, so, and that was like the, the end of that. There was no defense after that. All the doors had been closed to, to communicate. What happened to him? Well, he, I think it was a very public trial. So the person I was actually training with brought the trial forward. Uh, I believe he got the longest sentence for his uh, uh, abuse. And he was the head Olympic, uh, British head Olympic coach during my whole time that I ex you know, experienced it from uh, that age through uh, you know, 21 when I finished my career. And then I, my understanding is that he came out of, uh, out of prison and then uh, committed suicide. It's, it's shocking, Anne, isn't it, that these things happened and that they happened so publicly as well. And we heard, didn't we, from Gloria, that she felt very un, unprotected, that even though people probably knew that there was something wrong, that she didn't have any recourse to help from, she was let down by everybody. And I think at that point in time, sport was really not set up to respond to safeguarding concerns. Sport was seen as sport for sport's sake. Um, it wasn't particularly well connected into the rest, of the, the rest of the normal world, really, in terms of dealing with these kind of issues. And I think it's fair to say we have seen a sea change in the last 15 years. Having spent 20 years in local authority work, I've been immensely impressed by how the majority of sport over the last 15 years in the UK has responded and done something about it. I think one of the things that's important to point out, though, is it, when we started, it was all about trying to prevent the most serious abusers from doing what they were doing, and it was a risk prevention approach. And whilst that still stands, one of the things that's been really important is to be able to paint a picture for leaders of sport that actually the benefits of good safeguarding practice, the benefits of valuing your athletes, the benefits of creating a positive environment in which your athletes and participants can thrive. And I think it's really important to that we get the balance in that. If I can, I mean, that was what was interesting, I think, with Gloria's story and also yours. In, in sport, you're operating in such a hierarchical environment, you get told to do stuff, right? And that's not just at the elite level. I guess one of my biggest concerns, if you want to put it that way, is that we as a national governing body can get our framework, our systems in place, but I've got 550 clubs out there mostly run by volunteers who, frankly, are probably a bit over bureaucracy coming from the top. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. So there's suddenly a new requirement on them. Most people are doing this as their hobby. And the real challenge is to get that culture change all the way down the system so that you then stop these things happening further up the system. And we've used the CPSU, fantastic service. Same with sports resolutions, fantastic. But I mean, there is some really good expertise out there. And I guess the lesson that I've learned in 15 months in this role is go and talk to the experts. Find out what you can do. Don't be scared of the situation. Michael, as, as we are covering such a broad range, as we've said, and we, we're going all the way from the elite level down to the grassroots level as well. 
But do, do sports governing bodies have to take responsibility for those lower level clubs as well? Is there some kind of corporate responsibility that they have to be aware of? Absolutely. And um, that's one of the real challenges within the sort of sporting environment and the structures by which it's set up. And, and you, you, you've just said very clearly the fact that um, from the top, you're having to manage hundreds and hundreds of, of smaller parts of your organisation. Um, and your child protection policies will need to disseminate down right to every level because there is a potential for your organisation to have a legal liability for the outcome of any assaults and abusive conduct carried out by those under your wing who you have responsibility for. And to, to broaden it out, we, we saw the Adam Johnson case uh, earlier this year um, where he was convicted of inappropriate sexual relations with a, a, an underage mm. girl. And there was a lot of debate about how much responsibility the football club should, should take for the fans of that club. I mean, is, is, that, is that something that would have sent a lot of shockwaves and concern to other sporting organisations? Very much so. I mean, you won't be surprised to learn that there are some legal grey areas around all this, but there are certainly serious risks that if, as a club, you're sending out someone as an ambassador of your club and uh, that person is, is, at one level, doing your club's bidding, then the line of responsibility, legal liability, may well come back to you as the organisations uh, responsible for them. In an ideal world, of course, we don't want to get to legal cases, do we, Catherine? And I know that your organisation gives advice to coaches, to organisations, to sporting bodies, and also to parents about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate behaviour. And of course, when you're working with swimmers, with gymnasts, with young people, there is going to be a certain amount of physical contact between a coach and an athlete. But what is right and what is wrong? You know, I think people think that there's like this big gray area on that topic, but there's really not. There's a appropriate technique and everything, but I mean, I'm an advocate just to explain what you're gonna do, you know? So it's like, okay, we need to, you know, need to touch you here in order, you know, to, to spot you or whatever. It just requires communication in a respectful way. Um, but you know, it's like uh, I had a, a, a situation where the athlete was, um, the coach purposely put the athlete in a dangerous situation that made them rely upon this coach in, in an inappropriate way. And you know, and it, and it was like, because there was no oversight of the, you know, the coach is how that sort of came about. But so what, can, you, can you give us more details of, how, of, of that situation? There was a situation actually in uh, gymnastics. Um, the way that the coach positioned themselves to spot was to, you know, grab their upper thighs inappropriately. But nobody was in the oversight of any of that. Um, but it created this this false dependence. And you're a child; you can't say anything. There is no voice. Um, and it's you know been certainly a, a, the the tagline of of safer athletes is is you know give an athlete a voice. But and I also find that you have a young person is being asked to have a vocabulary of an adult. And so there's this misconnect be, behind, like, he's creepy, there's, it's, uh, it's ha this happening or this. And they, they can't really explain to you exactly in words that you need to file a form and, and to have this legal complaint. So I actually have spent a lot of time being like a translator from a young person's experience to get to the words and to get to something to where there can be an actionable uh, place to go. There's little incidences that, oh, they touched me on my shoulder here, or they did this here and they did, but they, but they add up to this whole experience. But those one incidences, we just kind of, oh, it was just this or it was an accident. But let me just tell you, 10 incidences aren't an accident. We don't spend the time truly listening and really getting a bigger picture. And that's how I think we create the gray area ourselves. There's not a gray area, is there? No. In, in my view, I mean, in limited experience, there isn't a gray area. It's about appropriate behavior and inappropriate behavior. Um, and I've had plenty of conversations recently and I'm like, no, look, it doesn't matter whether you're an employer, an employee, an athlete, a coach, it's inappropriate to do that. 
I just think it's, it's a very black and white thing. It's appropriate or it's not. Have things improved, Anne, since then? Absolutely, uh, things have improved, but not everywhere. The many governing bodies that are represented here today, the county sports partnerships that have been funded and have worked through um, standards processes, they have made massive changes in 15 years. But there, there will always be some dangerous pit people in all walks of life. We're very much more aware now of where the bigger risk areas are. There's been more investment in research, more in investment in evidence to paint the picture of where we need to focus our attention. And that is about setting a standard of behaviour across sport, making it clear what the expectations of that are, but looking at areas where there, we know there are significantly more risks. Talented and elite young athletes are unequivocally at more risk than other athletes. Disabled uh, athletes are more at risk. Children from BME groups are, are more at risk and we need to start focusing for the next few years on where are things hiding in the shadows that we need to do more about. Are there people that you know, Catherine, who feel like these things are happening in the shadows and there's, and there's no help for them? You know, I think there's a combination of having this consequence of if I speak up, what's going to happen to my career? So at the highest of levels, you know, I have peers of mine who, who've, you know, were on their country's Olympic team and their own child is, you know, at an elite level and been involved with a coach. And they themselves can't, you know, make action to, to make the change out of fear of the governing bodies not being able to take the right action. But then there's also the fear of this person getting this training. And that's the piece where we need to break that bond and have a safe way to remove somebody from their elite training environment because they're sort of a single site of, of, well, where else do I go? And there's this unknown. And so as a result, there's like, well, I can withstand this or stay in this until after my career is over. And I would like to be able to see that those actions can happen in the moment at the time. And I have worked with athletes, removing them from situations, and I'm now seeing them thrive in the sport. So they were going from a place of having to like lose their sport altogether to uh, being able to make this shift confidentially and then get back into their sport and then you know pursue the levels that they you know are, are desiring to pursue. So these are people who, who won't speak out because they're afraid that would end their sporting career? Correct. There may be parents listening to this, Catherine, who are thinking about the sports that they want their children to do. And as Anne says, that it can be so hugely beneficial in so many ways. And they might be worried now having heard this. What would you say to them? First, there's resources available, you know, to be able to speak up. But I, what I'd also say is, um, you know, know that you have the ability to make sure that that sporting environment has the appropriate safeguards in place. And there are channels to go and and to pursue that. And really, don't put your don't put your child in an environment where all the doors are closed and there isn't a way to speak up. And no coach is more powerful than the topic of safeguarding. And I'm a huge advocate of sport in itself and the benefits of being an athlete and how it shapes you and your ethics of self. And that's what. Um, I feel that we as to also have to have the moral and ethical um, integration from everybody who touches any person in sport around those elements. I, I essentially have really helped people to be able to say you don't have to stay there. And it's disappointing when someone doesn't want that help, but you, you do not have to stay in a, in a toxic situation. And, and the reason I sort of am saying staying is that the evidence does show that um, People stay in abuse over multiple years is the most likely scenario versus a single instance. It becomes normalized within your own experience. And to unnormalize it and walk away, it's okay. There are resources to be able to help you do that. So you do not need to stay there. Catherine, thank you very much indeed. Catherine Starr from uh, Safe for Athletes. We've also heard from Andy Parkinson, Chief Executive of British Rowing, and TVAS Director of the NSPCC Child Protection in Sport Unit, and Michael Pether, partner at BLM Law, specialist in defending abuse claims. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. BBC.co.uk slash 5